communication, the internet, and space exploration. That's actually the Vasimir um, plasma-driven, super-fast, <coughs> enterprise-like space vehicle that we're working on. So we can go to the planets because we don't like this one anymore. I'm going to quote uh, John Maynard Keynes here from an article in 1930. If you don't know who John Maynard Keynes is, he's the father of modern economics. For the moment, the very rapidity of these changes is hurting us and bringing difficult problems to solve. These countries are suffering relatively, which are not in the vanguard of progress. We are being afflicted with a new disease of which some readers may not have heard the name, but of which they will hear a great deal in the years to come, namely technological unemployment. This means unemployment due to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor, of running the pace at which we can find new uses for labor. To explain the chart, this is a this is showing that uh, previous to the Industrial Revolution, for all of human history, um, humans did at the very least 98% of all the work that needed to be done in order to live our lives. We had some horses, some plow animals, maybe even some um, windmills, things like that, but 98% was done for millions of years by us. This was a stable system. With the advent of technology, though, we saw unemployment drop drastically. People's purchasing power dropped drastically. And in the 1920s, they developed something called credit to keep up with all this. This has continued to the day. <coughs> Humans have continually moved from one service sector or one sector of the economy to another. In 1860, 60% six, of Americans worked in agriculture, now less than 3% do. In 1950, 33% of Americans worked in manufacturing, now less than 10% do. All the jobs have moved to what's called the service sector, which is over 80% of the economy today. However, the service sector has been replaced largely due to computerization in the modern age, contributing to our second great profession. Where is this going? And why are we doing it? If it's not for the plasma TVs, it's for the information conservation and acquisition built into our DNA and the structure of the universe. This is from Leslie White. He's an anthropologist in the early part of the 20th century. He advocated the understanding that we have something that's going on called cultural evolution. Culture um, creates a feedback process with biology. Biology creates culture in the minds of each one of us. We, we share it, we have language, we have the ability to learn and share. Then that culture then creates something called technology. Technology, as I've gone over before, extends our biology. It helps us solve problems we couldn't solve normally. It increases our fitness and helps us develop and create more unique ways of interacting and taking from the environment. Ultimately, he thought technology is an attempt to solve the problems of survival. This attempt ultimately means capturing enough energy and diverting it for human needs. Societies that capture more energy and use it more efficiently have an advantage over other societies. Therefore, these different societies are more off the page. What? <laughs> he was going to say something about progress, but... Ultimately, that's kind of what's happened in our modern world. Um, less than 0.05% of the people on this planet now still live in a hunter-gatherer-type lifestyle, which all of us did less than 10,000 years ago. That's a startling change. For millions and millions of years, we lived in that state. Now there's radical changes happening that we don't even think about. Here we shall finally look at our society, the most complex structure. We will look into how societies have evolved 
and form from the most basic level to understand some fundamental rules, look at some of the processes of selection that shape us and our environments, and take a look at some of the psychological and cultural adaptations that have taken place. Here we will end our analysis, hopefully with some better answers for the way things are than we started. This paper sucks. <clears throat> Along the way to becoming human, we develop societies. For most of evolution, organisms have existed in close proximity, often utilizing each other as food sources. Yet sometimes, the organisms are very similar, and instead of eating one another, they cohabitate and cooperate. The idea is that the genetic information they contain is of a very similar nature to what the other organism contains, and the more closely related, the more we are motivated by this information to help each other survive and multiply, altering one another's fitness, at times even to the detriment of the other. This is called kin selection. Let's consider first a bacteria colony. When a bacteria colony is in a state of plentiful resources, or when it has not exceeded its environmental carrying capacity, they tend to only kill and eat material that does not contain closely related information. This could be seen as a population in dynamic equilibrium with their environment. If it reaches a level of optimum efficiency in relation to all other factors or organisms in the environment, if the organisms and the resources are in a state of dynamic equilibrium, this is known as homeostasis, and is the closest thing to peace organisms have known. This is as true for humans as it is for bacteria. Conversely, if the environment is stressed and the organisms exceed carrying capacity due to either growth exceeding capacity or a decline in available resources, then a number of bacteria must also fail, which they do in a variety of ways. Some simply starve and die, some kill one another for survival. Some even send chemical signals to one another that causes them to die off, providing more food for the others. Of course, if the conditions shift rapidly, such as the insertion of poison, the entire colony may collapse. Sometimes something interesting happens. An environment that stressed a colony of bacteria, at times through something like poison or a, uh, some material they can't synthesize, They'll actually work together cooperatively, sharing information, genetic information between the different organisms so that the ones that can access that information can actually then synthesize the poison and survive. This is called um, horizontal gene transfer. And it actually has been uh, one of the most important uh, insights we've had into evolutionary science recently. Consider the analogy to our modern society. When things are bad, people tend to work together to try to help each other out, right? But when things are really good, they forget about that. Societies themselves, since they live in and technically are a part of the environment in which they reside, are under selective pressure of the individual level. However, many organisms have found a way to alter their competitive fitness by adopting cooperative processes into their framework. As in nature versus nurture, competition versus cooperation is a false dichotomy. Nature and nurture are seen to have a complex and dynamic interplay across time and space. And while one may have a situation with greater effect, over a long enough time, it is about their relation, not opposition. So too is true with competition and cooperation as it takes both in a nuanced interplay to bring about optimal growth over a long enough time. Our genes have known this before our culture did. The framework for our society is built on both of these. And in fact, our psychology prefers it this way. However, when one of these concepts achieves a dominant position for an organism or group, he is at a disadvantage to other organisms who use both tools for development, both individually and collectively, metaphorically putting all your eggs in one basket, or monocropping. This is akin to the false dichotomy between hyper-individualistic human societies and hyper-collectivist. Each may have its place in time, but each in turn will be at a selective disadvantage to one who uses both. Of concern is something known as Fisherian runaway where selection, which is centered on information, conservation, instead of overall survival, creates strange structures which may alter individual survival fitness. 
This is best seen in the peacock's tail. Girl peacocks love that big blue tail. And once they start selecting via accepting mates, these tails get bigger and bigger, even though to the outside observer, they are completely unnecessary and in fact may be detrimental to individual survival. Consider the analogy, again, of our modern society. Got cut off again. As we said before, humans have always been in a society. Humans, try, humans by their very physical and psychological structure require other humans for oxytocin, care and youth, interaction, and happiness, overall well-being. Poetically, no human being has ever been born alone. And along with our biological and cultural development, our societies have developed over time, from hunter-gatherers to tribes, in modern states, and to the burgeoning world society. Humans have adapted to these new environments, and they have done so due to their incredible capacity built from their genetic, cognitive, and cultural biases. As humans are social creatures, the power of society over them is always present in ways they themselves do not see. We have evolved to not only interact, share, and compete, we have also evolved to form coalitions which evolve groupthink, and we have evolved to respond to the pressures of the crowd. Experimentally, it has been shown that even if someone knows something is wrong, they will often not say anything, whether it to be a question in a classroom or someone abusing someone else. They do this to enhance their fitness and status within the group, according to the mores and customs of the culture. We also have evolved to respond to authority with subservience. The best clinical experiment is the Milgren experiment. This experiment used electric shocks to see if they could make ordinary people kill someone by use of a professional atmosphere and an air of authority from the researcher sitting next to them. It was found that around 66% of normal people would kill another human being simply because they were told to by an authority figure. What is more grievous and telling of the situation at hand is that not a single person even those who refused to participate towards the end ever contacted an authority figure to tell someone, hey, these people are killing people. This experiment has been repeated since the 60s over and over again with similar results. And my page cut off the rest, left to wing it. An interesting concept is the concept is the sociological concept of dramaturgy. William Shakespeare said, all the world is a stage, and the men and women are merely players. In fact, we have found this to be concretely true, both societally and psychologically. An interesting experiment that concluded that, that uh, contributed to this understanding was one by Phil Zimbardo called the Stanford Prison Experiment. Within this experiment, Zimbardo selected 12 normal college boys and put them in a situation where six were randomly selected to be guards, six randomly selected to be prisoners, and he himself would play the warden. Within three days, the experiment had to be concluded due to emotional breakdowns and abuse occurring within the play atmosphere. These people were losing their individual identities and becoming the parts they play. What's interesting as well is that Zimbardo himself didn't stop the experiment. It had to be stopped by someone outside because while he was in the experiment, he was the warden. And even outside of being the warden, he was the experimenter. He was playing these parts. Consider to yourself in our modern society how much we play the parts that are, that are just given to us, that we think we create for ourselves. Are we actors or playwrights? Could it in fact be that modern society is a result of a grand Fisherian runaway? That those same peacock tails that evolved in peacocks have led to the structures in our culture, in our society, that do not help us whatsoever. And they evolve for no purpose other than selecting us against the culture that exists already or helping us to mate. Is this where we're at?
Now, let us consider some of the ramifications of this lecture and what our imperatives will be based on for those insights. Then we will look at what we can be done with ourselves should we choose to do so. What is true? All life is related and interconnected fundamentally, biologically, physically, atomically, structurally, informationally. Humans need clean air, food, and water. Humans also need companionship. Humans need ways to explore their environments, both mentally and physically. Human culture is a serial process through which we exchange information and therefore alter and increase our fitness. And we enjoy our information. That's why we have the internet. We didn't just build it for fun. It's because it's what we do. We explore our environment. We collect information, just as we've always done. It's important to realize this is a serial process. One person doesn't do this. This is us all working together, all taking part in the play, building the internet, building the society. We're all part of it. It was here before we were born. What is false? Humans are not perfect. We're not the best creatures. We're only adapted for our environment like everything else. And there's nothing in us that says that we are superior and there's nothing within us that says that our intelligence and the ideas we cling to are anything that is overall adaptive or consequential. Our capabilities are not without limitations, as we've seen from our cognitive biases, as we've seen from the structures of our bodies. They're limited by the environment for a good reason. That's how they adapted. Humans have constructed an artificial, symbolic, abstract reality on top of the natural one, and that's the one we interact with most now. When we're using our TVs, when we're using our computers, when we're even interacting with one each other in person, we're doing it through language, through symbols, through interaction of symbols. We don't work the earth. We don't interact with animals. We don't do the things we did for millions of years. Consequently, humans create their own meanings and purposes outside of the confines of nature because we've, we've lost our way. We don't understand natural processes anymore. All we understand is the information we've accumulated in our heads. All those buckets of sand. So what shall we do? Think about it for a second. If we were to, set, if we were to stop right now, collectively, as a human species, and look at the situation. We know that we have the technology and the resources to change this world. We've been doing it for a long time. This didn't start now. We've been changing the world, changing the environment for millions of years. It's just now that we see the true ramifications of this runaway effect. We have to stop being part of the play. We have to become playwrights. We have to understand our limitations and use technology to overcome them productively. We have to understand our cognitive biases. We have to utilize technology to help us overcome these so we can see the world rationally and see the mistakes we've made and stop making them. <clears throat> our focus should be on releasing us from the servitude of these biases and the ideas they've created via the feedback pressures we felt. We've been modifying ourselves in nature chemically and behaviorally through advertising in the modern day world and before that through language. Language is to alter behavior. That's why it developed. But what are we using it for? More plasma TVs? <clears throat> we can, if we want, use computer expert systems to help us unravel the complexity that we biologically cannot. We operate with a heuristic system. We take a small amount of information, we extrapolate in our heads, and based on that we make a decision. Computers can access and utilize more information than we can. They don't have our limitations. That doesn't mean that they're better than us, but they do something more productively than we do, so we should use it. The same way we use glasses, the same way we use calculators, the same way we use scales. Our world can be a fair and just place for all life, but not within our current socioeconomic system. 
Our current model will never allow this to take place. Let me repeat that. Our current economic and social model will never allow us to be free or happy or in tune with nature. We can relieve ourselves of abstractions and concentrate on true discovery and exploration, both internally and externally. We can have a culture and a value system that allows respect, knowledge, and insight to be things to strive towards instead of to feel ashamed of. I want you to consider the analogy of a resource-based economy where we don't have abstractions like money or culture or things like that. And we understand how to fit within the natural, keep the natural homeostatic system from which we came. Thank you. Everybody fails the quiz. <laughs>